Hello the internet, I'm Gav. Welcome to this slightly different episode of The Slow Mo Guys, where I'm going to be visualising why it's important to wear a mask in public during a pandemic such as this one. We're quite visual creatures as humans, I feel like, and when dealing with an invisible virus, it's often hard to get your head around all the mechanics of how everything works. So I'm going to be using two methods today to help visualise the situation. One, slow motion footage. Two, I'm going to make it look really gross. Using the rather simple technique of harshly backlighting my mouth and filming what comes out of it with the phantom, we should get some disgustingly clear footage of how many particles can leak out of someone's face. It's not the same as Schlieren, you won't necessarily see the airflow and the change in density in the air, but if you do want to see a good video involving Schlieren, make sure you check out Joe Hansen's video, which I'll put in the, the card thing up there. Then we're going to watch the footage back with a special guest. Okie dokie, we're filming at a thousand frames a second in 4K with a 90 degree shutter just to sharpen up some of the motion blur on the, the speedy globs of gauze. I'm going to shine the backlight straight into the lens and basically block it with my head. I'll do a little demonstration for you on this one. If I turn off these lights and turn on this bright one, you can see that when I, when I get in the way, it really highlights all the particles. Oh, that's <laughs> disgusting. One. Okay, so you won't see the white in the phantom shot just because the ambient light off the walls is not nearly bright enough to show up on the phantom. So it should be a nice backlit black background. So now I'm going to reposition this and do it on the phantom. I'll start with a cough and then I'll do a, just a bit of talking. Maybe just count to five or something. Okay, <laughs> let's do it. Okay, I'm now framed for the phantom. The backlight, even though it's not for you, is now completely eclipsing the phantom lens. So here we go. Oh, God. <coughs> Feels strange just to <laughs> just cough into the air without covering it. Okay, we'll save that. All right, rolling again. Now I'm just going to count to four. One, two, three, four. It's really showing off the dust in this room. I've just glanced the footage. This is actually quite interesting. I'm surprised at, I'm surprised at what I'm seeing. I'm now going to do a test with a mask. I'm going to repeat the experiment. Do the same again. Okay. <clears throat> <coughs> Sorry if I seem distracted, I'm looking up at a monitor where I can frame myself up on the phantom. The beard out the bottom is not a good look. Okay, repeating the talking test. <clears throat> One, two, three, four. Wow, I'm not seeing anything now. Bit more pepper. <coughs> <coughs> oh. <laughs> Oh, now I can't stop. <coughs> oh. <laughs> it's, so, <laughs> it's so nasty. Oh, the string. I've stringed my nose. How do I unsee something? Okay, so now I've got the footage I want. I've got some good comparisons between wearing a mask and not wearing a mask. So why don't we watch the footage back and have a little chat with Dr. Fauci. Hello. Hi there. Nice to meet you, Dr. Fauci. Same here. Good to be with you. Thank you for having me. My name's Gavin. I run a channel on YouTube that specializes in super slow motion footage. And I've actually shot something for you so we can watch it together if you've got the clip ready. Yes. Did you want us to play it now? Yeah, I think it'll be a good jumping off point, And then if you have time, I can ask you a few more questions, maybe. All right, it's on. So this is footage I shot. It's a thousand frames a second, which is roughly 40 times slower than how it appeared in real time. And I just counted from one to four. Those are the numbers you can see at the bottom of the screen. And I was blown away 
at the amount of particles that came out of my mouth. Not only from the spit, sort of at the beginning of each word, but after I'm done with the word, particularly the word for, you can see like a fine mist come out of my mouth. And that was actually really surprising that I could see that with, with the naked eye. The particles that are so light that they don't fall. And I wasn't even shouting that loud. That was like a medium volume of talking there. Yeah, I think what you've just shown is a, is a um, you know, graphically uh, <laughs> beautiful uh, demonstration of the importance of wearing masks and face coverings. Because as the, as the film shows now, you're saying the same thing. One, two, three, four. Right. And very little is coming out from the mask. So, you know, we say, and, 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 and I think graphic demonstrations like you've just shown now really solidify that. One of the reasons why it's so important to wear a face covering is that we know now that about 40 to 45 percent of the people who are infected don't have any symptoms. And yet, they have virus in their nasopharynx. And we know that a substantial proportion of infections are transmitted from someone who doesn't have any symptoms. So people have an understandable but incorrect interpretation that the only time you transmit infection is when you're coughing and sneezing all over someone. What they don't appreciate is that if you are speaking, even if you don't speak loudly, and if you are singing, which is even worse than just speaking, you have these particles that come out that can stay in the air for a period of time. Some of them drop to the ground, which is the reason why we say keep six feet of distance. But some of them are aerosolized and can hang around the air for a period of time. For that reason, it's so important to wear face coverings, particularly when you think you're in a situation where, well, I'm, nobody sneezing or coughing doesn't matter. You proved it beautifully by just saying <laughs> one, two, three, four. Well, thank you very much for your input on that footage. I'm glad it. I'm glad I was able to show something worthwhile. Uh, I do have some additional questions just about COVID in general, if you have time. Yeah. Sure. So my first question is, with the vaccine on the way, will a large number of people refusing the vaccine reduce the overall effectiveness of the vaccine? Oh, absolutely. And that's the reason why when we conduct these clinical trials, you want to do it in a scientifically sound and ethically sound manner where you absolutely prove definitively that a vaccine is safe and effective, which is really the case with so many of the life-saving vaccines that we've done similar types of tests on. Because if you get only a small proportion of the, the, the uh, population vaccinated, the, vax, the virus still has the capability of spreading around to those people who are not vaccinated. You know, you've heard about herd immunity, which means if you get enough people who are either infected and protected or vaccinated and protected, you have kind of a shield over the community. But that's got to be a substantial proportion of the, of the population that's vaccinated. In addition, it also depends on the efficacy level of the vaccine. Because if you have a vaccine that's only 70 so percent effective, you've got to have even more of the population vaccinated. So you need a highly effective vaccine and the overwhelming majority of the population being vaccinated. And is that a percentage we can expect, sort of 70 to 75 percent effectiveness? You know, I hope so. Uh, the trials are geared two of them to detect a 60% efficacy with a degree of certainty, and one what I think is a 50%. The ones that are out in front right now are looking at a 60%. I would hope that we could get a 70 plus percent effective vaccine, because if we then vaccinate widely and combine that with continuation of certain of the public health measures, you don't necessarily need to be as stringent, but some of them, like mask wearing and avoiding uh, crowds without a mask, which is a surefire invitation to a problem. And what would you say is the most important thing that we know now 
that we didn't necessarily know, say, in March or when, yeah. when lockdown started. You know, I think it's exactly what you said. A, there were, there were a few things we didn't know. We didn't know what percentage of people were asymptomatic carriers of the virus. We didn't know the extent to which they could spread. And we didn't know the full spectrum of disease. It was either, well, either you go to the hospital and you die or you get better and you're fine. We know now that there are some people, maybe a significant number, who have lingering symptoms that go on for weeks, if not months, and maybe longer. We know that children can have a very unusual hyperinflammatory syndrome, uh, which is very similar to a strange disease called Kawasaki disease, where they get skin rashes and mucosal rashes. They often go to an ICU. They often have to be hospitalized. That's something that we need to take seriously. And would you say, this is quite a weird question, uh, not to put a positive spin on the pandemic, but is this quite an interesting one from your medical point of view? Well, it's interesting and perplexing. You know, one of the things that people have asked me, I've been involved in, as I say, chasing pandemic outbreaks for now over 36 years, um, ever since the very early days of the HIV AIDS pandemic. And when people ask me, what's your worst case scenario? What's your worst nightmare? I would always say it would be a new infection that jumps species from an animal reservoir and has two characteristics. One, that it spreads very, very efficiently from human to human. And two, it has a substantial degree of morbidity and mortality, either for the general population or for a certain subgroup of individuals. And we've had examples of outbreaks that have had one or the other of those characteristics, but not both of them together. Right. You know? <clears throat> and when you have both of them together, then you have a historic outbreak, the likes of which we have not seen in 102 years since the 1918 famous or infamous Spanish flu. So this is something that, as you know, involves over 215 countries. We now have, you know, a considerable tens of millions of infections worldwide with close to a million deaths in this our own country. We have more than six million infections and now very close, if not already, at 200,000 deaths. This is quite serious. I actually watched the documentary about the 80s about a year ago, and uh, fe you feature heavily in the HIV episode, so I felt <laughs> in very good hands when, no when you were on the news for COVID. Okay, I do have one final question. What has been, personally for you, the most frustrating thing about this pandemic? You know what, the most frustrating thing for me is is the lack of a of a uniform response among the states. You know, one of the great things about our country is we have federalism and the states have the power to do what they want to do. The only difficulty with that is that often you have different viewpoints and different issues that come up and states may do something different. The other frustrating issue is the lack of appreciation on the part of young people who, for the most part, do very well with this, with some exceptions, I mean, compared to the elderly and those with chronic conditions, is their lack of appreciation that by getting infected and not caring if they get infected, like people you see at bars, crowded, no masks, that they are actually propagating the outbreak. So they are part of the continuation of something that we're trying to stop. And although they innocently and inadvertently get infected and think they're in a vacuum, that they're not going to be harming anyone else. What happens is that they may be without symptoms, but they'll transmit the infection to someone else who might transmit it to someone who is vulnerable. That could be someone's father or grandfather or wife who's on chemotherapy for a breast cancer or a child who's immunodeficient. So I'm frustrated by the lack of appreciation that we are all in this together and we're going to end it by ending it together, not having some people pay attention to what they should be doing and other people not. Yeah, absolutely. It, it makes it extra frustrating for those of us who have hardly been out and, you know, wear masks all the time when we do go out, when you just see people in the media doing absolutely nothing at all.
it makes it makes everything that we've been doing seem a bit pointless. Well, not pointless for yourself, but pointless no. for the outbreak. In other words, exactly. pointless to get control of the outbreak. You, should, you make a very good point. Well, Dr. Fauci, thank you very much for being in this Slow Mo Guys video. And thank you for everything you've done for humans on this planet. Well, thank you. I appreciate your having me on your program. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to meet you. Well, there we have it. Using a light and a high-speed camera, I feel like we've sufficiently visualized the microscopic, lighter-than-air particles that just leak out of your face when you're having a chat. It's, it's, it's scary stuff. Make sure you wear a mask when you're out in public. Big thanks to Dr. Fauci for agreeing to talk to me in this video, and even bigger thanks to you for watching it. Make sure you check out the other videos on the channel. They're not all as serious as this one. And please subscribe if you like what you've seen. I'll see you in the next one.